designed by the Holy Spirit to see things come off the page. We are tempted by the devil not to want to look at the page. There's that tension there. Um, the Holy Spirit will speak through the word. Amen. Luke 19, starting verse 20. He, that be Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Awesome. The idea here is you're going to have three characters. You have Zacchaeus, you have the Lord, and then you have the grumpy people. Okay. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he did not, because he was a small stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry! And come down. I must stay at your house today. So I heard he came down and received him joyfully. And when he saw it, the grumble people grumbled. He was gone to be the guest of a man, gone to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, the whole Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have to any one of anything, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to you in this house, since he is also the son of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus, real man, real issue, we're going to be the book of Pharisees, is blindsided. I believe blindsided that Jesus is going to speak to him. On his side, all Zacchaeus is thinking is, I'm a wee little guy, and I need to get up in a big old tree so I can see what's going on. I want to see this man. Something has stirred there. That's, that's much of this. So he does the tree thing. And then he gets blindsided. I don't really like Jesus. Jesus refers to him by name. You <laughs> don't have the tree. By the way, they wore ropes back then. That'd be interesting how that all played out time the tree and a rope. He comes down and they have the conversation. The, the men get grumbly. What Jesus says at the end, which is, he came to seek and to save the lost. That, that's why he's there. And the grumble people are not interested in seeking and saving the lost. They're only interested in grumbling about this tax record because they don't like it. But Jesus says, no, I'm here for that. Mm -hmm. And you're missing that. So that's, that's the story that plays out in the flesh. Now go back, that's three pages, maybe four. Go to Luke 15. This is the parable of the same thing. And by the way, if you, if you know the Gospels, this plays out ten times in, in various scenarios. And Jesus came to save the lost. The Pharisees are grumbling, unhappy with the whole scenario, and Jesus is successful. He's, he's just going to really do that. We're going to do the, the parable of the prodigal son, but you have to get into context. So we're going to go away to Luke 15 in the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners, that means that is, were all drawing near to him. Stop. What this means is significant. The average religious person in Jerusalem, in Israel, Galilee at the time, they did not like tax collectors. They didn't like the sinners. And the idea to understand that, I want you to know follow in place here. They didn't like people who, who had, had moved over from the norm of morality, as they saw morality. Or they had moved over to the idea that they're going to chart their own course. It's okay to see it both ways. And you can do that in our culture. That there are people who have decided to take a few steps from morality. They're going to do their own thing. They don't really need God. If they ever knew God, but they they just want to create their own morality. They don't want anybody over them to say how to be moral or not moral. They're, they want to do what they're going to do. By the way, there's a little bit of all in that in all of us. And there's other people who would say, I don't know if I'm going to be rebellious or stupid or arrogant or a sinner. But I, I, I'm just going to go my own my own way, and do my own thing. Well, if you think it's like a parent, if your kid does one or these two things as a parent, as you raise them, the, the normal parental reaction is, "Ouch, my, it's my kiddo." And as a parent, because we tend to be a little older than our sweeties, we, we see that path, and we know either from our own footsteps or from seeing it that that path is not going to lead anywhere good. That path, they, they, they need to get back. So that's that's the that's the idea that the, the religious leaders didn't like the Pharisees and the tax the, Phar, the Pharisees didn't like the tax collectors or the sinners. And you can throw all sorts of people in there. 
because they had done one of those two things. The Pharisees wanted people on the straight and narrow. The Pharisees wanted people who thought like them, behaved like them, believed like them, lived like them, supported what they supported. It, it, that, was, that was their family, and that's what they wanted. If you went too far, that's why they would be synagogue views. We'll get to those stories like that. So, that's, that's the preface of this whole story, and with the Zacchaeus story. The religious people and leaders in the general crowd, those people they did not like. And they were not interested in their reformation or their change or anybody seeking after them. They, they were not interested in that. If you want to make up a current connection to that, look at it this way. Pick whatever political party you want to be in. It would be the people on the, on the far end either way. And you would go, from the far sides, you would go, they are leading us down a path of AT double hockey sticks. They, they are making a mess of things. They are, this is not going to end well for my kiddos, for schools, for politics, for, for health. And we tend to see those people not as people we would want to embrace, buy over to dinner. These are people that somehow, some way, we would just prefer to like squish. We would like somehow cease, stop, alto. That's what we want. We are not pretty interested in warming up to them. We, we'll see them on TV, we'll see them on politics, on the internet, and they, we, we grind their teeth. We're ready for an argument. Just don't, don't do that on the internet, by the way, because it's completely untrue, untruthful. We can feel the same way about people. So that's, the, that's where it begins. Back, back to Luke 15. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. They came to Jesus. So these French people came to Jesus. They saw him. So it would probably be today if Jesus walked the earth, the far right, the far left, there would be something they would see in Jesus that Jesus would be a man. And mm -hmm. we see that as bizarre. Because we want Jesus to come and kind of flip them off the map. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, for some reason, they're gone. And the tax and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees, verse 2, the scribes grumbled, that's what they're, they're really good at that. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Because they must be defeated, they must be conquered, they must be shushed, they must be canceled or whatever. Okay, so that sets the stage. Verse 11. And he said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. He invited his property between them. Now many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took the journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. The word prodigal, by the way, does not mean wayward. You know, if you have a prodigal son, it doesn't mean that he's wayward. It means he had a chunk of money and he misspent it. Dictionary.com. Use it on your phone if you want. The definition of prodigal is not wayward or rebellious, knucklehead. Fool, it is someone who has a chunk of money and they are just reckless with it. That's why he's the final son. As we go through the story, you're going to find out it's also the prodigal God. Because God will be reckless and completely a spendthrift with incredible wealth. And in all appearances, throws it away on a derelict son who comes back and has no chance to prove himself, and the father just throws all this stuff at his boy. It's a prodigal God. And we're going to like that God. So it all starts here with the son having the audacity to say, Dad, I want what's coming to me when you're supposed to be dead. I like it now. He gets the money, he chases after it, he spends it, and it all goes south. The prodigal son is us in every way. And that's part of the story. But all the way, more importantly, as religious folks, we're really actually the second son. We start as the first son, we end up the second son. Start as the first son, the second son. There is something in all of us with our desires. And part of that desire comes from the way we see the world. For whatever reason, this son sees that his dad will eventually give him a truck full of money. That's how he sees his world. And his dad will not give it to him that he can walk out of the house. The house would be home. 
where those morals are and the, the, the safe rails are and wisdom and he will walk out away from that and he will discern it. It, that's what he thinks but more importantly that's the way he feels he wants to spend money in a way or make it a little looser he wants to spend his life in a way that is just not going to end well Everyone knows that because of sin. Whatever sin we get sucked into, big or small, it never ends well. If it doesn't hurt somebody else, it hurts us, our conscience, our character, our emotions. Sin never end, ends well. Sin, I've said this before, sin makes us stupid. That's good theology. It never ends well. And so we see the story, and we can relate to the story, because if we were given a whole chunk of money, chances are we would not spend it all that wisely. What would we do? We would spend it on us. Why? Because that's the way we see the world, and that feels so good. And that's what he does. He goes and spends it. Moving on. And we just spent everything. A severe famine arose in the country. God has a way, by the way, he's very good at it, of taking our greatest ideas of being dumb, and saying, see, you're really dumb, and you're going to land sometime because you don't see the future coming. All you see is the money or the power or the prestige or whatever. You don't see if you chase after that, that's going to crash somewhere, or it's going to have a hard landing somewhere. It's not going to play out as you want. Sin never plays out as we want. It has never played out as we want. It, the, the theology of it, it's called the fruitless wages of sin. And do it in your, in your mind, with your kids or with yourself. It always ends poorly. Sin never ends well. So that's what happens. God has a way. God has a way. We have spent everything in a severe family and rose in the country and began to be in need. No kidding. Verse 13, 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him in the fields to feed pigs. There's a little caveat here. <coughs> The boy's raised well, by the way. He has a work ethic. Nice. He realizes when he does hit bottom, he goes gets a job. <coughs> that goes back to the wisdom, because the father in this thing, by the way, is God. And God has a way always within our hearts, even in the midst of stupidity. He has a way in our hearts to keep directing us, keep prodding us along, keep reminding us, lift, keep whispering in our ear, keep bringing people into life. That is the nature of our God. So right now, let's just say you're all horrible thieves, and you're stealing from banks left and right, and you're, you're all, we're all criminals. And all of our lives in the midst of that, God is still working. It's still working. So you see this desire of this young man, the younger brother, to be a prodigal, to have all this wealth and just spend it stupidly. And then you have the desire of the father to say, I'm going to keep chasing you. I'm going to seek and save the lost. Amen. And the son's not going, you know, <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for always being there beside me. He just want, he doesn't want anything to do it. He's left home. He wants to do his thing. All right. 16. As long as he fed by the paws of the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. <clears throat> he brought rock bottom. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, he was to his senses. And again, don't think that he's all of a sudden went from stupid, dumb, fool, reckless, to all of a sudden smart. Whenever we come back around to God, it's always a God thing. It, it always is. It is God who is, who is leading and prodding and is pushing us. It is always God behind us. That is our God. And let us be very, very grateful for it. If life is left to ourselves, what would it look like if God wasn't all his gifts and all his kindness for us? When he comes to himself, verse 17, he said, How many of my father's tired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. What do you think he got that from? This idea of justice, the idea of doing right, the idea of restitution, the idea of, I need to get this right, to put a knucklehead. Where does that come from? It, it always comes from God. I think it was Colin this morning, we're talking, we all have this internal sense of justice. It, you 
see it in, in little sweet kids, you're lining up to go into the classroom. And someone cuts the line. And half the kids go, teacher, teacher, Billy, cut! Because we have this inner sense of justice. Ever been on the freeway? I have. And you're, you're totally alone in a very decent speed, a little fast, and someone comes flying past you, and you think, oh my gosh, how bad, how wrong, how, how dangerous. <laughs> we ourselves are speeding. That's that sense of justice. It, it, it is his. That's a God thing. He has this inner sense of his father. I have done wrong, and I must go back. I must go home. I must go back where those walls are, those boundaries are, and where the safe zone is. Because I went here or I went here. I must go home. So God, by the way, is always doing the trick to us. Steve, come home. Steve, come home. And you don't always hear it in a voice. It's just those little things in our life. Come home. So all of us, at any given day of our life, because we always drift, we are always drifting. It's, it is <laughs> present tense. No one is zooming into the Lord and camping there without slipping, sliding, drifting away. We're all drifters. Some of us drift with like huge sails. Good no wind. And when that boy, when that sail goes up and the wind gets it, we're out of here. That's human nature. So he wants to go back to dad. He wants to go back. And he has a sin. Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. He uses the word. I have sinned. It's a good word. It's the biblical word. It is straightforward. It is the announcement of what I have done. I have sinned against heaven before you. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. Call your boy your son. He rose, came to his father, verse 20. But while he's still a long way off, ready for a prodigal God, but it's still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion. God came to seek and save the lost. That compassion is all capitals. All of very large font. It is huge. So on any given day, we in this room, God's compassion is all caps in a huge font. And we might think, well, God is cruel or harsh or distant or silent or worse. And God would say, oh, you just don't know. Oh, you just don't see. Oh, your mind is over here and out of here. His compassion for us because he came to seek to save the lost and to keep the lost. He rose and came to his father. If I was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. What did the boy feel? The desire to go spend all this money recklessly. And eventually the older brother will say it's for the prostitutes. So it's not pretty. It's horrific. If nothing else, such things just will tweak us. Almost anything will tweak us. But that will really tweak us all. So a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. The boy feels desire for sin. The father feels desire for compassion. That's reality. Ran, embraced him, and kissed him. And said to his son, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. There is a huge break right there in the text. Because at this stage, I as a father would be thinking, if my son has come back to this home, there would still be a part of all of us, we would want to say, welcome home, sweetie. Welcome home. Let me hug you for a good two, three days. I'm just going to say hug here. But also in our minds, as we're parents, we'd be thinking, I'm glad you're back. I do not want you going left or right. I do not want you going away. I don't want you drifting. And particularly if the child has taken a chunk of parental money, and in this context it's property, and squandered it, there would be a little bit of the parent going, I am glad you're back. But boy, we're going to make some boundaries, like break walls around your sweet little life. Because there's consequences, and there's grief. And there's loss because you're back, but that money, that property is sold. That wealth is gone. That's the break. And the father says none of that. The father says none of that. The son says to the father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I've no longer really called your son. Break. Verse 22. But the father said to the servants, bring the quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the 
bad that you have to kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For the Son of Mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. When we come to God, He does not say to me nor to you, You may come home, Steve, but you must pay the consequence before me for what you've done. You must. You have sinned against, as you've said, against heaven and against me. You have sinned. If you want to, or I'll just read it to you, go to 2 Corinthians 5.19. It'll be to your right, some six books or so. It'll go Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.19. 2 Corinthians 5.19. There is a, a term here, a word here, and it applies to the boy, it applies to us, it applies to God. This is some of the richest of all theology to know, of all things of God. And understand that compassion. Understand that, that man, the Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. That is, in Christ, God has reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Not counting their trespasses against them. So if you go back to the story, when the son says, Father, I am not worthy, he does not count any of that against him. He does not pull out a letter and say, this property is gone. He does not say, you, my son, family name, you squandered this with, do with that. He doesn't count any of it against him. He doesn't raise one statement of how wrong he's been and bad he's been, how, how reckless, foolish, stupid he has been, how sinful and ugly and rebellious and immature, selfish, capital S, how self-centered, self-dominated, utterly blind, he doesn't count any of that against him. None of that. Where does it go? It goes to Jesus. Everything that boy did, theologically, and in reality, goes right to Jesus. He comes back, all the same goes to Jesus. It's just that fast. It's gone. The boy is back. He is hugged. The party begins. He does not count any of that against him. That's scripture. And that's why it's so cool to see it. He does not count it against the boy. He does not count it against us. That is incredible. Inconceivable. Crazy. That is unhuman. That is only divine. That is only a God. And he looked me in the face and said, Steve, I can give you 5,000 things you did wrong this week. Some of them were blind, but most of them are just stupid, rebellious, and selfish, utterly ungodly. And it's all on Jesus now. It, it doesn't even get mentioned, it just goes. You see the, the son's repentant heart, it just goes. Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he has a whole system worked out. As soon as you come, the sin goes. We are the white snow. That's why the party begins. God could not party. God could not have a meal. God could not embrace the sin. The sin goes. He embraces purity. He embraces Christ. Because we are taking on Christ. Our sin is gone. Isn't that? You can't put words to it. You can't say it right enough. That is our world. That is our reality. And when Jesus comes to seek and save off, that is desperately what he's trying to say. He's saying, he has to come down and have a dinner at your house today. You guys don't like you over here. We're going to ignore them for a while. I have a story for them later, though. Huh. But let's go, because I came to seek. I will not count any of this against you, ever. I will never pay that. You will be home. Home. All right, we're not done. Twenty-five. Now the little son was in the field. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. 
He said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed a fat calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. Verse 28. But he was angry. That's the response. The father throws all the sins away, pushes them all away, does not throw them away. He puts them on Jesus, who will die for them. Horribly, sacrificially, willingly, out of love. The brother's response is anger. We are the older brother. We begin as the younger brother. We end up the older brother. Of all the human emotions, of all the human affections, of all the human desires, our greatest is anger. There is no greater internal, immediate response to things greater than anger. We will feel anger faster than we will feel love. And I shouldn't have to explain that. Drive the freeways. Even with our own kiddos sometimes. It doesn't always have to be the word anger. Frustration. Annoyance. Cutting in just a muy poquito bit of slack. That is our natural human response that comes the quickest. We find the affection, the emotion, the desire, the reaction of anger to be the utter quickest. It is, it is alive and well and thrives in us. Ever been one to complain about politics? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Ever been one to complain, be annoyed, angry at stupid television? Ever been one to be angry or frustrated and annoyed with your spouse? Ever been one to be quick to anger at the church? Been those in it? Oh, come clean. We're <laughs> <laughs> all in that pot of stew. You see how quickly it comes? It is a life and life. I'll keep going with the Lord. Ever been angry, annoyed, frustrated, gossipy? about work things? Ever had an employer, boss, supervisor, CEO, whoever, and that you knew more bad about them than anything good? There's a famous Abraham Lincoln quote. He's a good guy. He says, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. What a dear thing to say. <laughs> because we would all know then, if we get to know each other, we're all the same. No one's that's the issue here. He thinks he's better. That's the issue Jesus has with Pharisees all along. They think they're better. They are better than politically here or politically here. They are, we are not interested in seeking and saving the lost. We are interested in somehow to cancel them, shush them, vote them out, send them into exile, <coughs> lop off a couple legs in the process, just for fun. We don't see what Jesus sees. They don't see us, but they talk to us. And that is ache. They see something in Jesus, despite so far from home. But Jesus is home. There's something there. This one. Pastor Ray. 28. But he was angry. He refused to go in. So if we get past the anger, quick emotion. What's the next quickest emotion we have? Defensiveness and stubbornness. Ever argue with your wife or husband? How quickly can we get stubborn and defensive? <laughs> Employment situations, how quickly can we get stubborn or defensive? So a dear friend says, you really ought not to be doing that, sweetie. And we get stubborn and defensive. He's us. But he was angry, refused to go in. His father came out. His father came out. His father doesn't go, whatever. You'll get over it. So he sees the sun, hears of the sun, knows of the sun. He's angry. He is stubborn. He refuses to have anything to do with his brother being home. And the father goes out. The father has compassion. The father, that's his desire. I will be compassionate. The first son's desire is spin breakfast. He's getting prodigal. 
The father's desire, I will be the prodigal with my wealth of love, and I will, I will give it everywhere. My rebellious, stubborn, angry son who refuses to come in, I will go meet him. I will make the first step. I don't care if it's coming to me, I'm going to move to him. Isn't that cool? And that's our God. When he was angry, he refused to go in, so the father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, which if you can do the math, if you're having tension with a son or daughter, <laughs> the first thing they say to you is, look, that may not go over well with you as a parent, now would it? Look, look, Dad. <laughs> and that's what he does. Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Just put in parentheses, liar. Yet ne you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. You might be thinking here, you know, for what this one, well, you know, sometimes parents are not wise. Maybe they can be stingy and selfish. They're human. We're not that. But when the son of yours comes, this is a brother of mine, when the son of yours comes, who has devoured your property with prostitutes and killed a fat calf, you killed a fat calf for him. And he, <laughs> God, the father, said to his son, you are always with me. In our stubbornness, in our defensiveness, in our sin, in our rebellion, what's it say there? Son, you are always with me. We are never far from God. We can be way over here, be way over there, and God will always say, You're with me. I'm with you. I'm right there. Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. All my wealth is yours. Son, you live in it. You live on the land. You live in the house. You live with the servants. You live here. All this is yours. And God has said that to us in so many ways. If you want to put near the top of this, it would be us, this church. I have given you this. And we're quick to complain and gossip and backbite. And, and God is saying, oh, you don't see the you don't see the beauty. You don't see the joy of giving you this. But you just, you just can't. It's much more than just the church. It's much more than we believers. It is that snow and that cold air out there. And guys are going, ain't that cool? Get your jacket on, buddy. It's going to be a cold day. But feel it. <clears throat> Shelly and I have <laughs> taken regular indulgences to that cookie store over past mantra. You know what I'm talking about? It's a word misspelled for it. It's all crumble. It, they make those cookies. <laughs> they put them in a box. And they're often warm. And they're nice people. And you can watch them making all the dough. They have literally like a, a table full of dough. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and God would say to me, Shelly, that's where you live. This is the world I created for you. <laughs> we'll get a cookie. Just one, Steve. Go get a cookie. Just make sure I rode our bikes on the LA River Trail, which can be pretty grungy, but after a storm, it's, a, it's an act of God. You see us come through there. Started at the park, went all the way to downtown, and then back. And it's just, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh my gosh, look what the, all the flood did. It, it was all those wow moments. And then we start seeing the herrings and the ducks. And some of those geese were a little aggressive. And God would say, that's it too, Steve, that's it too. That is, that is life. Shelley caught wind of a, of a movie that an individual had watched this movie. It's an old, old, old Paul Newman movie. And because this individual saw this movie, this individual became a lawyer. So Shelley last night says, let's watch this movie. What's it called, Shelley? The Verdict. The Verdict, Paul Newman. You gotta see it. So we watched it, and it's unlike any modern movie. Because the morals and the tension is just so straight and not manipulated. And you, we watched it, we kind of go, oh, we're really glad we watched that. We're really, it made like in the 60s. It was really good. And God would say, Steve, this is my world. And I brought that movie into Shelley's life. Unbeknownst to her, that we'd watch it, and your evening was spent on some fairly decent television. It's clean. That, that, we live in that world. That's what he's saying to his son. I, all this is yours. And you're begrudging my love for your brother. You're complaining. You're angry. You're stubborn about 
your brother. He's your brother. And that plays out in the family, by the way. That plays out in the church. It plays out in the workplace. Brothers and sisters, we are so quick to gossip. We are so quick to complain. We are so quick to get on our high horse. We are so quick to be self-righteous, indignant, a laundry list of the errors of, of a boss or an employee or a family member, uh, in-law. We are so quick to do that. And that's the older brother. And the father says, there are brothers and sisters out there that you're talking about, that you're angry about. All right, one more time. Son, in 31, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. That's the virtue of rejoicing in the world always. No matter the circumstance, rejoice in the world always. Regardless of the knuckleheads in your life, the painful people in life, rejoice in the world always. Because our nature is to be angry and defensive. <clears throat> it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother is dead. idea. You notice the story. There's not even no a response. The only other response of the first son is repentance. He leaves the story open. Why? Who's he addressing it to? All those Pharisees and Sadducees, religious folks, the local power figures, those who had the, the power buttons and control. begging for a response. He's prodded for a response. He has showed them that the son did return. And he shows them that the father does embrace. He shows that the son was completely a prodigal. Wasted. And that the father is completely a prodigal. Fat and calf. The best robe, which probably would be the father's robe. The ring on the finger, the shoes on the feet, the hugging of nothing else. Just the hugging. We are made for that embrace. We are made to come back together. We are made for that. But he leaves the story without an ending. We don't know what they did. Or do we? They eventually these great men and kill them. Because they remain stubborn. And they remain angry. And they remain hardened. And they look down their nose at Zacchaeus and the first one because they don't want those people in their world. stories are profound because God is so good. He does not fight with the older brother. He only embraces the younger brother. He is so good and that's the God to us. I want to prod you, nag you, that if you are drifting today, I'm going to make that. We're all drifting today one way or another. sins in our lives that can be so deeply rooted that coming home can be nigh and impossible. At least turn left or turn right or aim home. At least aim back. At least pick up scripture and don't be rebellious to scripture. And if you just only read the prodigal son and the story of Zacchaeus, Luke 15, Luke 19, and blow off everything in John, do that. Because you'll see God come home. Let's all come back. Let's all not be the older brother. Let's all be the younger brother. Let's be that person. I don't want you leaving here today if I said something that has prodded you or nagged you. If, if, if you. if you're the younger brother and 
you know you need to come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I want that embrace. I want my sins. God, come find me or come find Daryl after church. Please, please don't leave here as a prodigal. Don't leave here. Come back as the son of embrace. Can we close in prayer? Father, mighty God, we thank you for this morning. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his example, his teaching, what he really did with that kid. Father, we thank you for Jesus and all that he shows us. Father, help us to come back. Help us with the drift. Help us with the stubbornness. Help us with the self-righteousness. Father, draw us back. Open our eyes. Soften our feelings. Draw us back. Father, we desperately need you. We need you. Father, I pray for this in Jesus' name. I am. Um, quick prayer request. I just got a fact or a text from uh, Rick Halstein. Annie Dirksen was going to church this morning, fell in the parking lot, and broke her hip. She's go yeah, she's going to into surgery at 4 o'clock. So prayers, please. Okay. Annie was here last week. Chopped in Rick was working on the sound system. All old members broke in the church.